Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for the Lean Six Sigma for Good podcast. This is Brian, and I've got my friend here, Elizabeth Swan, joining us today. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks hey, for Brian. joining me. Absolutely. Can you tell me a little bit about your background in continuous improvement or process improvement? Sure. I realize now it's it's over 30 years, so it's, it's decades. But uh, <laughs> if I think about my start, uh, there's couple big things that stand out. I was uh, working, kind of helping uh, more sort of setting up projects, things like that for a, a process improvement firm. And they had been around since 1935, uh, Rath and Strong, and they were part of the rebuilding of Japan after World War II. And I learned about setup protection and just-in-time cafe. I mean, just-in-time <laughs> I'm sorry, I went right into uh, what, what that means to me now, but I really did learn it years ago, this guy, Ed Hay, that wrote about just-in-time manufacturing. And, you know, I, I learned at the feet of all of these greats. Um, it, was a, it was an astounding uh, group of consultants. And I was um, kind of working in a minor role. And then, and this is important because it drove my career, I went and saw, it was, I think it was a benefit for Oban Pan, like their 10 year anniversary. And I was helping uh, a friend there and Improv Boston performed, All right? So I watched them just do a skit. They made it up, you know, about being in a Oban Pan, that's a coffee shop in Boston, uh, being in one of those. And I just thought, how are they, this is magic. How are they even doing this? Like, this is crazy. And I found out where they performed in Inman Square in Cambridge, and I went to see them. And, uh, and they, uh, they were astounding once again. And uh, one of the guys in the troops, I swore he was looking at me like we were making eye contact, and he was really cute. And I thought, and then they said they offered workshops. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do workshops. <laughs> I'm going to meet this guy. And uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the guy who is still my friend who ran the workshops was a phenomenal um, improviser. Uh, it turned out not to be interested in me or any women, but uh, I loved the workshops. And, you know, at first I thought, you know, pff, what are we, scientists, consultants, teachers, firemen, this is not going to be funny. But I realized, oh, everyone's hilarious. The skits are hilarious. It's about mistakes and sort of seeing where things go. And I ended up performing with them for years. Um, I performed on traveling troops. I performed um, uh, all over the country. And then um, I realized that I could do anything. I was like, oh, if I can stand on a stage with no script in front of thousands of people and make stuff up in a scene. And, and eventually we did... Um, musicals right so we did um you know improvised musicals yeah I just look back and go how, how did I even do all that but it, it gave me the courage to leap so in you know I was 80 it was in 89 I was working with these guys and by 96 I thought enough people were you know telling me hey we need you know we'd love you to do this we'd love you to do that I thought I can go independent you know, so that was exciting uh, to make that leap. And that that was uh, afforded by improv, which I kept in all of my work. Right. I always think about in process improvement as improv, that you could go anywhere. Right. And you've got to be working with people. Right. So improv is problem uh, solving problems on stage. So your your constant collaboration, you're listening really intently to see what are they offering and where is this going to go? And it's the it's the same things that make great. Uh, process improvement efforts. So anyway, that's, that's a little background. And then were you doing that full time? Or is that I, also you're still doing work as consultant and doing improv at the same time? Or improv was weekends, it weekends. was at nights and weekends, okay. we'd have, if it's odd for people to hear you practice, we practice at night, we have rehearsals during the week rehearsing how to, you know, make things up. And, and it's structured. It's very structured. I'm back to that, you know, structure sets you free. You know, we work in structures. Well, so does improv. Um, but yeah, I did that at the same time. And that until the thing that stopped me with improv was really my career taking off and becoming what a lot of us call being, you know, a road warrior. 
I was now, you know, traveling too much to be relied upon to, you know, to be at shows. So uh, that, that changed, but it was good. It was great. You know, I never, I never left that, but it, it, uh, it sort of propelled the, the rest of my career. Yeah, I remember the Wrath and Strong material from early 2000s that I had seen, you know, around Lean and Six Sigma and some of that, some pamphlets I remember going through and maybe some workbooks or little pocket guides, maybe. Oh, um, yeah. I feel like I've I... found a few of those things over the years. That's true. My colleagues of mine, I think, worked on one of the pocket guides uh, yeah. under, you know, within Gold QPC. I think they were the, the great producers of the pocket guides. But yeah, there's a lot of great authors, a lot of great work came out of them and yeah no, that was that was a great experience so where, how did that transition into maybe going on your own at some point or some of your more recent work so the, the there's a couple of pivotal transitions um and one of them was i kept running into people from a firm called pivotal <laughs> so it was uh i kept being drawn to this group and I met them, uh, this is back, uh, it's, it's, it's also mid nineties and GE became like the engulfing all Lean Six Sigma people everywhere. So I went to Bake Offs where it was like, okay, which consultants can you know, work which gigs, which led to a really hilarious uh, string of gigs at NBC, right? Because GE owned NBC back in the day. So I was out in LA with a whole group of consultants, a lot of them from Pivotal, I got to know. And we were working, we were running simulations on the set of Saved by the Bell, which is so cool. Um, and uh, we were working with execs, weathermen, you know, everyone inside of uh, NBC, which was, which was a big education. Can you explain and, like some of the examples? Because I think that's, that's a great one to figure out like, oh, it can't possibly apply to entertainment and TV, like uh, what were some of the problems and issues that they're working through and experimenting on? Well, that's a but great question. And it reminds me of a hilarious story of just the process of tape to air. If you think about people in the field, you know, there's a beekeeping segment and somebody's out there interviewing somebody who's doing this great work in their community and that's on a tape. And then the tape has some numerical and alpha designator. There's a tape room. Then there's people who remove tapes because there's multiple segments on a tape and that might go anywhere. And NBC's on multiple floors. And you've got to get, you know, first of all, find the tape. If someone took it out, did they sign it out? And then which floor are they on? Can you find them? Can you find the tape? So I don't know if you saw the movie Network News. There's this great segment where I think there's an intern that's just like racing through floors and people with a tape. And at the last second before someone's saying, you know, and here we go and getting it into what was then probably a VCR, you know, and then it's like, boom, it's on air. And that's what it was like. It was this crazy hunt and, and torturous racing around and a lot of, you know, interns, you know, being beaten up, like, where's my tape? Where's my tape? Um, so just the yeah, processes like that were, uh, were great for sort of explaining, you know, what, how could this go better? Nice. That was a good one. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And from there, the, I, like I said, that's why I met all these folks with Pivotal and, and, and I got to know them and they reached out and they said, Hey, uh, there's another Northeast project we're looking at, which is Starwood Hotels and Resorts. They are, um, they're headquartered in White Plains, New York. And would you be interested in helping them? They're, they want to, you know, do a transformation. So that was, that's uh, something that lasted decades for me, you know, on and off, just working with training everybody at all. They had 800 properties that sent me all over the world. I mean, I would be training people. I know that your heart's going to bleed for me. I had to go to Venice. I had to go to Dubai. I had to go to Croatia, Jordan, um, yeah, Egypt. I mean, just the, the classes where I, and the people I met were incredible. And those are still a big part of my world. You know, even when they got bought by uh, Marriott, you know, I still know the folks there. And then it's a really interesting thing because working with people in healthcare, you know, 
it's, it's the same. I've even worked with people in prisons, like getting people in and out of beds with different sense of urgency and protection and <laughs> rules has been, it's similar processes, right? Right, right. Obviously lots of differences, but yeah, that informed. And if you can imagine just telling, you know, I'm sure you tell, we all tell stories to help people learn. Everybody gets being in a hotel. So those stories also sort of stick with me for, okay, this will be easy to get, you know, in terms of a story. So anyway, that's, that's a, a broad swath of how I got from there to here. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a lot of different industries and different experiences that you can leverage when you're teaching or coaching teams. And I think that really helps people understand, especially like you said, hotels and um, something that they're familiar with that can really resonate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, what I, I what I really wanted was local work right? Uh, all of us, you know, at a certain point, you're like, do I have to fly every week into um, uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa? Do I, is that part of my life now? I'm just going to be doing that. And this was serendipitous at a moment of like, all right, let me think about who's local because Cape Cod, I'm in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, you know, it's kind of, you know, I think it balloons to, oh, 30,000 in the summer or something. And then it's tiny in the winter. Anyway, there was a woman who ran the Cape Cod Child Center, uh, which is uh, throughout, throughout the Cape, they have agencies. And she Googled Lean Six Sigma Cape Cod and found me. Now, I think Tracy joked on, when she was on your, um, on your uh, podcast that if you Google Elizabeth Swan, mainly you'll get Kira Knightley who played Elizabeth Swan in the Pirates of the Caribbean. So luckily she didn't know my name. She just knew Lean Six Sigma Consulting and Cape Cod. And she found me and she was in a town maybe 25 minutes away. And she said, hey, can we meet at a Panera Bread right between us? And I said, sure. So we met and she just said, look, I'm working you know, with Cape Cod Healthcare and uh, we are providing services for you know the folks that need it the most on the cape we run head start programs we help teen moms um you know we really do a lot around education it's a nonprofit, and you know would you like to help i want you to train my people all my staff to be green belts you know i want to do projects and raise the bar on how we run stuff you know i want to grow i want us to grow and help more people and i was like sign me up. This sounds amazing. And also just as I'm sure, you know, and I, one of the reasons I admire you is that you've made that, you know, a focal point, but it was suddenly this feeling of, oh man, this is, this is exciting. This is exciting to do work, uh, to do purpose-driven work. And I happen to have been, um, worked for them as a teenager and this was just a week, but my mom, when I was in school and she wanted to be available to us, she worked a, a job that would make her be home by the time I got home from school. She worked at the daycare center. Now the daycare centers are also were run by Cape Cod Healthcare and it was very new. She worked with them way back very early when they started and she was a cook. She cooked for the kids at the daycare center and she had an assistant and she got really good at working on a budget. Like, how do I feed all these kids on this much money? And they actually, when she moved on, they were like, can you please explain to us how you did that budget? How did you manage to do that? So my mom, I see, has little glints, little glints of, uh, of lean in her. So <laughs> That's cool. I should have thought about that. Really but neat. she wanted to go on a vacation and she said, Elizabeth, could you come? and just be the assistant to my assistant. She's gonna cook for the week, but if you could help the rest of the jobs in the kitchen prep and clean and stuff like that. And I was like, a teenager like money? Yes, I could do that. So I, I just told this woman, the new CEO, I was like, I worked for you guys when I was a teenager. This is a great full circle for me. Um, so that was a great beginning. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So what were the, yeah, what was the, 
desire to do green build, you know, how did they arrive at that? What was the problems they were trying to resolve with that? Or are they just trying to figure, they weren't quite sure. They just knew that they probably needed some training or. Um, the, the CEO had come from corporate. She would made the shift. Uh, she had been in healthcare, but she wanted to do, go into the nonprofit side. And she had been trained as a green belt and she had seen how much they could save um, and how much they could basically improve the way they ran their business. And she wanted to bring that into the nonprofit. She saw we're running on a shoestring and we're, the more we save, the more we can help folks. So she wanted to, and she wanted to give back to her leadership. She wanted them to be trained in something they could use anywhere, right? To have these problem solving skills. So she just saw the possibilities and she was, and she knew if she framed it right, she'd get a grant to bring me in, which she did. So she got a grant to train all her people. And then we started looking at, okay, what, what are some good things to tackle? Um, which was also a really cool experience. Yeah, we came yeah, up that with- That makes sense with the grant to try and get um, funding. Cause I'm sure that's a, not easy to go to the board and say, we're gonna invest thousands of dollars into training our people and hopefully we get that return later. Trust us, that's a, and, and here's some techniques that most people aren't familiar with probably on the board. So I yeah. bet that's probably a, a good route for them to go is through a grant, a workforce development grant or some sort, I'm guessing. Yeah, that is a great idea. I'd forgotten where she got the funds, but that makes a huge difference for anyone wanting to do something like this. Hey, you're going to help the business. You're probably going to save money. You're going to free up bodies and cash and time and labor, all that stuff. So yeah, good. Good point. Uh, so we... Yeah, we, we got together and we said, all right, what are some things, you know, the kind of classic fix what bugs you, what's, what's bugging you, what's costing money, what do, you, what do you see that could be better? And one of, the, one of my favorites was um, the office manager. And she said, oh man, you know, she had this great term for it. I have to look at my notes, what was it? Oh, it, the, the, the uh, expense, you know, ordering supplies was called order as you wish. <laughs> like, it was just like, whatever. It, it, people just had credit cards and it was just like, and it was all last minute. Um, and it wasn't from any particular vendor. Uh, so she went about, okay, let's, and she had to get, you know, she didn't have positional authority over some of these people. They were higher than her. So she had to get her boss, the CEO to say, you know, I back you on this. Let's, let's work this process. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of pushback on little things like, you know, don't change the soap. I don't, I like the soap. I like the way it smells. Do not buy new soap, right? I'm used to this, like, and, and don't fix what's working, right? Well, there's nothing broken here. So, and, but she said things like there's daycare centers where they had dishwashers, but they're still ordering up paper plates and napkins and, and plastic silverware. And so she said, well, that was unnecessary. And, um, and, and, but the more she poked, the more she kind of got pushed back until she finally realized, uh, she said, hey, wait a second. If we save the amount of money I'm trying to save, like, then we can afford a mortgage on another daycare center. And that shifted everybody. And it's not only nonprofits that where people need to know why, but just a reminder to come back to your purpose. Like, why are you doing this? What's the What's the purpose here? And that shifted things in such a way that people started telling her about ideas they had for saving money. And, but, but generally people got on board um, and she shifted it enough to get the, to get the new mortgage. So that was exciting. Um, and, it, and it was a lesson for her and like, oh, okay, I need to explain you know, what this is about. But she also did things like demonstrations, like here's the new soap I got. I tried this one. It's I'm going to show you how it works. Like, here's the, you know, it's here it is on me. And then she said, they use it in NICU units, you know, the uh, needle, needle intensive care units. She goes, so it's definitely safe for us. Like she just like put herself, uh, you know, more in there, listening to them and, and responding to them. And the other thing she found was that she's looking at the phone bills and she's like, are we using all these phones? And 
something called Wi-Fi sticks. I don't even know what those are, but um, so then she just started looking at the usage. She just looking at the invoices and she saw, okay, if nothing's happening on this phone, then let's just turn that off. And I think right away that was 1500 a month. So just massive savings on just like starting to scrutinize how does this happen? And yeah, so that was a big one. And that was a, that was a cool one. You know, that example with the soap is very typical though. It's, it's, you almost have to do some of that detail work of even small changes like that have to get vetted a little bit and bring people in. And you might think, oh, no one's going to care about that. But until you do it, then you find out, oh, there was a lot more stakeholders than I realized who cared about these things. And it feels like I think people get a little frustrated, like, oh, I have to do all this effort. Why don't I just tell people what to do? And then I'm done with it and they just have to live with it. But they're not seeing like the long-term effects that that brings and it frustrates people. And then they feel like they don't have a voice. And so it feels like a lot of work, I think initially, but once they see that, hey, it goes smoother and people are, are enjoying it and then they'll, they'll bring forward other ideas, I think it does pay for itself when you invest that time into yeah. even little changes like that. I've, it can really derail things if you <laughs> don't include the right people. Yeah. Um, and then building on that notion that you just said, you know, include the right people. Another really interesting one, and this was a woman who was monitoring what was happening in the daycare centers. And there were like 39 incidents a month. And that means you know, an accident, uh, furniture damage, uh, a kid might get hurt, you know, all, all these things come under incident, which was, which was high. And she's like, I want to lower that. But she went to the Gemba's, you might, you and I would say, like, she went to the daycare centers to understand what's causing this. And she watched and she, she wrote up room layouts, you know, if you can imagine like spaghetti charts of how the kids moved. And, but what she saw was if they had these really open areas, with like these low bookshelves, the kids would use the bookshelves as launch pads. Like this was places to jump. <laughs> and, and it was just kind of like, just place to run, you know? So jumping and running and crashing into, you know, uh, other furniture was, was the norm. So she's like, okay, so we need to create safe spaces. We need to create like, here's a reading nook. Here's a nap nook. Here's a play area. And let's move these things out of the way that look like launch pads. <laughs> and that dramatically dropped incidents. I think it was down below 15 a month after that. And then in one, in one of the daycare centers, she saw it creep back up. So she was trying to understand that. And she went to one place and it was the one place where she did not, she redid the room over the weekend. She didn't have time to meet with the folks but she knew the floor plan that worked. So she just did that one over the weekend. And when she came back, you, you're gonna tell me, guess what she saw? Everything put back the way it was. Everything put back the way it was. And she was like, oh, I didn't work <laughs> with them. I didn't do it with them. And so as Tracy would say, people don't like having process improvement done to them. They want you to do it with them. So that was a big lesson there, but you know, she, mea culpa, she, sort of went back and said, okay, let's, let's work on this together. Cause we've seen it work, you know, elsewhere. And you tell me, do you have some ideas beyond what I came up with, you know? Um, so that was a great one, but sort of back to your point of people want to be included in that process. That was a good one. Um, another one was, uh, let's see, this one was the hiring process. And that just reminded me it's that process comes up everywhere. Like, isn't that just a bugabear everywhere? Everywhere. Yeah, so I think it was like 72 to 172 days to hire people. You know, just, and imagine now, like you've got the great resignation, like you, you've got to work fast, man. People are like, you know, maybe they're going with you, but hey, you're too slow. I'm going over here, man, because I got options. Um, and she you know, kind of dug into the boxes of like old data. Cause another thing they had to get used to is we got to have some data folks. And they're like data, you know, just that whole, like, you know, what have you got? What, anything, what do we know? She's like, I know, I know where the emails were. 
when I got a hiring manager saying I need somebody and then I, I've got, you know, when people can hire, like, great. Okay. So we got something to work with. So she built that. And that's when she was floored at how long it had been taking. So she's like, well, what's going on here? So she started looking at, you know, the different processes, each hiring manager kind of had a different way of going about this. And we've seen that, like people said, there's no process. And I was like, yeah, there's a process. There's just a lot of variation in the process. So she looked at that and she saw also um, they were entertaining incomplete applications or applications from people that really were not uh, qualified. You shouldn't spend time here. So it was like, let's weed out uh, and let's make our applications a little bit easier to fill out so that we don't get the incomplete ones. So I, I, find, I don't know about you, but I find a lot of things go back to the form, you know, like what the form is making people do. Like you think it's so silly. It's like, well, it's just a piece of paper, but there's some places I worked with, there was like a forms department. I worked with Alberta health systems up in Alberta. And uh, they, if I said, they were like, oh, but it says a VP signature on here. And we don't need a VP signature anymore. But I said, well, let's just get that off the form. They're like, oh no, we have to go to the forms department. That's like three months right there. I was like, hmm, <laughs> that's not like good. another improvement area. <laughs> so the good thing about some nonprofits is they're small, you know? So it's like, change the form? That's me. I changed the form. Awesome. It's so done. <laughs> it's done, man. So she did that and that made a big, uh, yeah. So anyway, she completely altered that process and uh, they knocked it down, you know, within a couple of months. So that was great. Um, so that was forms and another interesting forms one. And this is a term I learned from them, which, which you probably understand is in kind. Yep. That term, like if you services, donating services, donating services. And, and so, I mean, even me, right. I could donate some of my consulting time and that became in kind. And then, you know, for someone who's donating it, you know, if you want to keep track of that, you put it on, you, you make it formal and you put it on your taxes and you say, I donated this time. That becomes part of what you register as, as your donations. And that was that term and that uh, notion, but she was working on a project that she said, we're not capturing the in-kind services we're getting. And because of that, we're not getting the grants we could. Like some grants wanna know, we'll give you more money, the more in-kind services you are actively getting. Right? I see, okay, I was wondering why they were track that or need to know that. Okay. Yeah, why would they care? Which I learned that too. So I didn't know that that could, could impact grants. Like the more you are on your end getting in-kind services, the more they're interested in giving you grant money. So they wanna see you doing that. So she looked at their forms once again, and she realized that people couldn't figure them out, but she also realized there's a lot that was the same every time. So she just pre-filled. She's like, well, I don't need people to try to figure this out. I know those figures. I know that information. I can just put that right in the form. So that made a huge difference. Um, so clarifying forms and oh, the other thing, it had that a, a bonus of once uh, parents started hearing that your in-kind services increase grants, then they wanted to offer more services. Like, let me help. I can donate time for the daycare centers. I can donate time uh, at, at this you know, particular center. So that also went up. Their in-kind went up for both better recording of it and also people were offering more. So that was a cool uh, outcome. And yeah, I found again, that, that that's pretty typical, right? If if once you start tracking something or saying this is important, then sometimes, you know, that, that skews the data a little bit because people start recording things or not recording things, depending on that. But just the fact that you say this is important to us and all of a sudden you magically just start seeing better results or increases just because there's now a focus or a priority on it. Yeah, and maybe they before they were... I wasn't even, I mean, I did not know that term, which I felt kind of like, boy, I'm a dope. <laughs> like, why don't I know that term? Um, another great one was an office manager who, her, the whole process that drove her crazy was 
they had all these providers, people who were working at the daycare centers, things like that. And they had to submit timesheets, right? Here's what I worked. Then they'd get a payment voucher. Then the payment voucher would turn into a check. Then they print the check. And then it would go to the CEO. And she signed the check. And there was infinite rework around getting the right attendance record. And, and amongst, there were lots of different bugaboos. Some of them were hilarious, but one of the main ones was people were just emailing these things in, in formats that were too huge for people to read. So they were just, they couldn't figure out what they were looking at. <laughs> so one of the fixes was just, here's how to send it in. Here's an easy way. Like there's all those, you know, you probably use apps like Scannable, things like that. You can immediately make an easy PDF of things. It was like, eh, just do this. And, and then just boom, you're done. It's in and we can read it. So that was one. Um, they also realized they were constantly printing vouchers on this pink paper. So that meant you got to, you know, again, small, scrappy uh, office. There's only one printer. So then they put the print paper in. So then what happens? Everyone's printing their stuff and it comes out on the pink paper. So it's like, oh, what's well, a pink paper? And like, oh, I'll take, it, I'll take it out. Sorry. It was constant reprint, print, and, you know, like tossing stuff out and ordering special paper. Until finally they were, she asked, why, why do we have to do these on pink paper? Well, this, of course, you've seen this, right? It goes back, I don't know, a decade or more, like Ron from accounting <laughs> had this idea. It served a purpose, I'm sure, but no one even can remember the purpose. So let's just not do that anymore. Let's just not do that. And the, um, the hilarious thing in my head was, Someone told me this story a long time ago about Goodyear. Uh, this was a project at Goodyear and they were trying to um, lean out the process of shipping tires. And at one point they questioned, why are we putting tires in boxes? Like they, you know, like these things are going on the road. Like why do they need to go in a box? And they traced it back to the eighties when white wall tires were the thing. And you had to put the tires in a box so you wouldn't get any Mars on the white. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> so not selling so many of those anymore. So let's just stop doing the boxes. <laughs> and that, I told them that story about with the pink paper. So that was good. I heard another project that someone was working on getting rid of staples. And they're just trying to get people to quit stapling papers together. And so it, it went through all this effort and but it was saving a bunch of time and the cost of staples because they were doing thousands and thousands of these documents and like the effort just to get people to stop stapling two pieces of paper together or something was <laughs> just so difficult to get people to do but um yeah it's you're going back to just like we don't need to do this and i thought it was a pretty good really simple it example is. but they really struggled like it took them a long time to get that process rolling you know it's almost like you've got like muscle memory like yeah but we're i'm i'm supposed to be you're like no no don't do that anymore there's no reason to do that yeah it's almost emotional like don't that's wrong don't do that why how are you taking away the stapler um yeah those things die hard and then uh what was it this oh the last piece on hers was why do we have physical checks we could just wire this money just do electronic payments and then voila, no going to the CEO to pull her aside every week to do all the signing of all the checks that have all been printed, hopefully not on pink paper. You know, so it's like they saved so much time and, and effort on that. And, you know, a little bit of money here and there, but that one just was a lot of people's time. Uh, also big in nonprofit. There's a lot of work to be done, you know, so you don't want to do that. Yeah, and, and they're already overwhelmed with work i mean it seems like that's been the common theme is that people are got a long list of things they need to do or a lot of things that are broke or their their mission that they have is is they're so passionate about it and they see the huge gap from where they want to be and so it just feels overwhelming at times and the last thing you want them doing is caught up in these terrible processes that are eating up a lot of non-value at a time when they could be doing work that's actually meaningful and 
helping the mission of the organization. And so yeah. it's almost these are necessary improvements that you have to have, or you're going to burn people out and they're going to get frustrated because they're not actually working on the things that they signed up for when they joined that organization. Yeah. Um, so true. Like freeing people up to do, especially in an ar ar arena like that, like there's so much where you're going to be adding value. And you just reminded me of one last project that um, really touched me because it it's back to um, the things you don't think about in terms of emotional impact on people. And this woman was trying to understand people who she knew were homeless and then they could help them if they were, would not identify as homeless. And so she, and she realized it's a point of pride and it was a way of seeing yourself. I don't want to see myself as a homeless person. I'm just bunking with a friend for a little bit. You know, I'm just using my brother's spare room, like whatever it was, they didn't see themselves as homeless. So once again, the form that she used, she realized nobody was checking the box homeless. So she, so we said, okay, do you know the criteria? She goes, oh yeah, absolutely. I know all the things that make that for us qualify as homeless. You are, you know, somebody's couch, you are, you know, using your car, whatever, you know, just like, so I have other questions I could ask that help me at make that, you know, designation to get them the help. Then they qualify, then I can get them help. So that was another one, like, let's rephrase that and just do, do you fit any of this criteria and not use the word homeless. And then the amount of people responding went up and then the amount of uh, money they got to fund went up. And, you know, again, it was a, a great series, but being mindful of what does that feel like for the human being you're, you're dealing with? Absolutely. And then it kind of goes back to like the data quality, because you're looking at these forms and saying, oh, it's not, the problem's not as big as it seems, or we're not getting as many people as we think there should be. And um, if you just trust that data, then you don't uncover those types of issues. If you go back and say, I'll have, you know, you know, somebody's homeless, you have them fill it out. And then you're like, wait, they didn't even put homeless on there. What's going on there? So that kind of helps uncover the, the gap in the data, which is really driving a lot of the process, not seeing mm -hmm. those things marked. So that's cool. And it, it's a good example, too, of really getting to know your customers, you know, that you can't make these assumptions. You can't do this in a room. You got to get out there and, you know, have the conversations and experience it and go. And then that's that's where you you, you get the big ahas or you, your assumptions kind of go by the wayside. Those are great. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of good projects in there. Thanks for sharing those. Yeah. I know you've done some other work in other sectors like government work. And is there anything else you want to just highlight from some of that work as well that people sure. are interested in? Yeah, I mean, and there's little things that, you know, stick with you in terms of um, what made the difference. Another big not, uh, government agency I worked with was Centers for Medicaid and Medicare and was working with them to train folks, you know, to be problem solvers. And I was working on a project or coaching a woman on a project and she was uh, vision impaired. And she was, her metric was to imp improve, increase the amount of alt text people were using. And once again, had no idea what she was talking about. So what she said was, I rely on that information. If I'm online, then I've got to, if there's a photo, if there's things that I can't, like I have a way to read text, but I don't have a way to figure out what a photo is. So if, if someone doesn't describe what's in the photo, then it's lost to me, you know? And that was like one of those things that I never forgot. And I post on LinkedIn all the time and I put photos in all the time or I put drawings in all the time. And I always go to alt text and I try to give the best description possible of what is in that image. And I always think of her. I think, you know, like that was such a great learning for me that there's a whole world of people I wouldn't have known. I would not have known the impact of processes, that piece of a process, that piece of the internet. 
on on people. That was big. Yeah, I just uh, learned about that too. I mean, I knew that that existed, but I didn't know the who uses that in presentations till I gave a presentation to an organization that folks on blind and deaf blind. And they're like, please, for every photo in your presentation, put a description of that photo. And that was just last year. So yeah, I mean, we you come up against it and you're like, ah, okay, got that. Um, and the other, another big organization, big government organization was the, the Alberta healthcare system. So that's a huge network uh, and across the province. And it is government run, which means it's also in the news. And when I was pulled in, my, the team I was pulled in with, that was back with, uh, when I was with Pivotal Resources, um, that we were brought in basically to bring a transformation, you know, start one that they could continue. They knew it would take a while to transform all the facilities into Lean Six Sigma facilities. And what started it was the newspaper headlines by the opposition uh, candidates showing the lines of people and the cots uh, uh, crowding the hallways in emergency rooms and just the complete mayhem and inability of the system to process people. So that gave me that sense of, ah, they're in the news. This is huge. This is touchy. Everything we do is going to be something that could be relayed positive or negatively to the public. And we had what we called a war room in this basement in, uh, in Alberta. And just as an aside, because I've worked in the Bahamas, I worked with the Bahamian telephone company, and I felt like it was penance. I got sent to Alberta after that. And it was, um, uh, I, had, I had a team meeting and people were late because the gas froze in their cars. It was 45 below zero. And at that oh, point, no. oh. it doesn't matter if it's Celsius, or Fahrenheit. So that, that was a big learning for me. Okay, so now I'm in the basement of this hospital and we are mapping from the ER, you know, from admission all the way to discharge. And it goes wrapping around this massive concrete wall and lanes of doctors and nurses and PTs and OTs and labs and uh, you name it. And we would, we built this great swim lane and then we were working on the pain points, right? So nice big pink post-its for everywhere that people were like, oh my goodness, once I could see a patient, it takes me like 15 minutes or 45 sometimes to get to somewhere where there's a computer where I can put my notes in, you know, like that's just a huge waste or patients being left out waiting for labs. And so just everywhere there was a pain point. But then I also realized it was a meet point. And uh, we had a people would bring people down there. They'd say, oh, come see the map, you know, and they, they, they'd show it off. Like, here's what we did. And then people would add <laughs> more, more pain. And uh, I was in there one day when there were ER nurses and then general medicine nurses. And there was a handoff, right, of a patient that had been admitted. And the pain point was from the GM nurses saying, general medicine nurses saying, we just don't get enough information. We're calling back to get this information about patients for, you know, multiple times. Uh, and the ER nurse was there and was like, oh, oh, we can fix that easy. I got it. And they solved the problem like just by being together at the map. And that was, that was really inspirational. So I feel like that became this great focal point where, you know, doctors and nurses and people could just get together and discuss some of the stuff that crossed the lanes, you know, and it's, it stopped being, you know, like their problem and, you know, us, them. So that was a big uh, uniter. And I still get, that took 10 years. And at the 10 year mark, one of the doctors involved wrote me cause she'd, um, she'd been heavily involved in it. And she just, I just want you to know we're there, you know, we've arrived, we have an amazing, amazing, um, system it, you know we were problem solvers everywhere and 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 then she retired um and i still get cards <laughs> i still get cards from alberta just every year you know what are you doing in what are you doing these days and anyway so that was an incredibly um again felt really good that you know one of the people we had on the teams was a, a patient advocate talking about 
you know, her dad going through the system. So again, it was like ah, really getting to know people and how this affects uh, human beings going through it. So that was a big one. Yeah, and I've heard that too from people who've had bad experiences in healthcare is they really just want the process to be fixed. They don't want others to go through that. So I can imagine that they could see like these problems getting resolved and they're like, that's exactly what we want, right? Just to not have to go have other people go through that same experience we went through. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's amazing to be through that whole transformation and see that it's pretty, it is pretty rewarding to be on the back end of that. Yeah. You don't often get to see that. Very true. Well, great. This is this is some awesome examples here. Um, so what are you working on now? Tell us about the Just in Time Cafe. Any other activities, projects are going on? How can people get a hold of you? Stuff like that. All that good stuff. Um, so I'll just say anecdotally, I'm working now with UC San Diego Health. So another educational and healthcare facility, uh, teaching and coaching green belts, people to become green belts and do projects. And so it's great to be in healthcare again. And back to, you know, like I said, it's getting people in and out of beds, you know, like those same process I remember. So that's exciting right now to be back there. Um, and the Just In Time Cafe, that uh, Tracy and I, uh, just incredibly proud, just making it a hub for where we can pull people like you and other people in our community and who have great things to offer. So whether it's, um, we do webinars of people teaching other folks, like, you know, how do you, how do you use lean to, you know, fight uh, racism? You know, how do you, uh, we've got one coming up, which is, you know, how do you make it lower, lower the bar and make it easier for people to get involved in Lean Six Sigma? Don't, don't make it so challenging, you know, for people to get involved. Is that the one and with Amanda? The, yeah. Yes. Okay. Awesome. I'm psyched about that. Amanda Zimmerman is going to be presenting all the way from New Zealand. <laughs> um, and then uh, the podcast, I feel like that, like you and me now, like you and I have been on, um, we're in the Lean Communicators together. But I was thinking, I want to get to know Brian better. Like, this is a great way to get to know people. Like, this podcast is relationship building. So that's a really exciting thing for us to get to know people in our community. And, and from these days, like, we can do it all over the world, right? So people I've, you know, we've interviewed from Dubai, from, uh, from faraway lands. And, uh, and then we also just wrestle with the issues that are compatriots are, are wrestling with and stuff like that. So that I think just uh, fills both of us with joy. Like that's a thing that we believe a rising tide lifts all boats, you know, so that just helping to spread that just feels great. Um, so that's, that's a, a labor of love. And then the, the thing that I've been working on lately, which has been exciting for a year now, I've been writing a post a week. I illustrate it. Usually I've got um, a, a, a little bit of a sense of humor. So, cause you have to take a, you have to um, be a little bit humble about what the, you know, what we run into all the time, right? There's just stuff that no matter what we do, we're going to hit this problem all the time. So just bringing a little bit of fun to it, but just telling the stories over the past 30 years, so many stories of different things that bring a, a issue to life for me. And then just asking my colleagues, how do you deal with it? So um, generous colleagues all, all add really nice ideas of how to deal with it. So I just got um, a publisher asked, we wanna pull that together into a book. And that could be something that you know people can then take those issues, look at how people dealt with it and think about, well, how do you wanna deal with that? Like experiment, right? So I'm pulling that together now. So that's a new labor of love. Um, and if people want to get in touch with me, they can reach me at Elizabeth at JITcafe.com. I'm, I'm not a believer in acronyms, but when it comes to emails, you have to shorten things so, so people don't have to spend too much time typing. <laughs> That's Elizabeth with an S. Oh, yeah. Just like Brian with an O, it's yep. Elizabeth with an S. And <laughs> both of us, our entire lives have said, actually, my name is spelled... <laughs> If you wouldn't mind changing that. <laughs> or that's fine. Close enough. <laughs> I think you and I are actually, you're like me. I'm like, Z, fine, whatever. I, I take what I get. But with email, it's important. Yeah, it won't get to me if it's a Z. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Anything else you wanted to add? Or 
No, it's just really great to talk to you. And it's great to remember these projects. You know, these were, these were great. These were fun. And it's just, that's the great part of this work, you know, getting into it with people and seeing them, you know, succeed and, and uh, have a big impact on the world. It's great. Yeah. And I think that, that your examples are really going to be helpful for, for people to think about like how this might work in other settings and other industries, especially nonprofit and healthcare. So great. Awesome. Spread the love, Brian, spread yeah. the love. I will. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Bye.